their knowledge and to help people educate themselves um, using online resources. So um, we're also very lucky today to have uh, one of our curators with us. Karen Lemmy is the curator of sculpture here at the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Um, and I'll let her tell you a little bit about um, her work and, and the works we have here at the museum. But um, take advantage of the time that she's here and the, the knowledge that she can share with you about the topic of sculpture. Um, and then we have some books and some to-do lists and some other resources we can share about when we get into the editing portion uh, of the day where we really dig in and, and make some improvements um, on sculpture-related content in the video. So again, welcome and uh, happy to have you here. Um, welcome. Um, I'm really pleased to be here and um, delighted to be part of the stellar team with um, Andrew Lee. I, I, I have to confess, I'm one of those people in the museum world who totally dismisses Wikipedia. Ah, it's not Wikipedia. I don't know if it's right. And then, you know, when somebody says something, it's a word unfamiliar to me, the first thing I do is. <laughs> oh. Well, that's a starting point, and that really is true. I mean, it's, it's always a starting point, no matter how much um, you know, we get into the, the validity of what's in there, the content, it's still an undeniable starting point. So I'm, I'm curious about what lies on the horizon. How do we take the starting point and make it uh, an, an anchoring starting point where you, you can believe in what's there, where you know uh, how to vet the content, or how do you know where to go next for for more information. And sculpture is a really quirky area uh, within art history because it's the area that's taught the least. Uh, if you take an art history course, usually there's not much sculpture. Um, it's it's a, 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 a practice that one can only learn by watching other sculptors. It's not like um, other areas of art where you can be more easily self-taught, although there are self-taught sculptors. There's a tremendous amount of technical knowledge, and I think that's been off-putting over centuries, and, and it's made sculpture this really specialized category. So, uh, in some ways, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if someone did a study of all the art-related material that's online and noticed that sculpture is probably the area that's either underrepresented or understood the least, or maybe even misrepresented because it's already a very challenging material to teach um, through traditional methods to begin with. So what I thought I would do is um, do a couple of test cases using the Greek slave, Hiram Powers Greek slave. How many of you know about Hiram Powers Greek slave? Great. So this was the most famous sculpture of the 19th century. And the Europeans agree that the Americans got, hands down, the most famous uh, sculpture of the 19th century. So it's really an incredible work of art to begin with. Let me just give you like the two second summary of what it is. Uh, it's a sculpture by Hiram Powers, who was one of the foremost American sculptors of the 19th century. Like many 19th century sculptors, Powers moved to Italy, set up shop there, and never came back. And so his clientele were grand tourists, British and Americans on grand tour. Uh, he had greater access to marble. Uh, greater access to nude models, which was a major factor in the 19th century, and uh, also access to professional carvers, which is important because it may come as a surprise, but no sculpture in this period is typically made by the artist himself it's, or herself. It's usually made uh, through this kind of collective force of plaster casters, uh, professional marble carvers, um, of varying degrees of skill. So the artist is sort of the genius behind the model, but then it, it becomes this kind of, maybe we could call it crowdsourcing, that they're all in his employ. Um, okay, so what's special about the Greek slave? It, it goes on tour in the United States, and it's the first opportunity for most Americans to see a sculpture of a new female figure. Radical for the 19th century. Um, it also is shown in different venues to separated audiences of men and women. Um, and it also took on special meaning. The first version, he, he modeled it in 1843, and I'll get into what that means by modeling versus creating, um, in 1843. And so these are the decades running up to the Civil War. And so in certain contexts, it was seen as uh, referencing the American slave market. And she is meant to be a Greek woman who is captured by the Turks and is um, 
put up for sale in a Turkish slave market. So she's understood to be a white-skinned woman who's been pressed into slavery. She's Christian. She has this little locket with a little cross at, uh, on the support arm there. But um, she's also read in the United States as referencing American slavery. Other audiences in the United States, uh, there were southern plantation owners who acquired versions of the Greek slaves, so she sort of became this icon for the times, and it's not like everyone who had one was universally abolitionist. She was also sort of understood as this beautiful neoclassical reference in the past, um, not necessarily abolitionist. But anyway, that's a little bit of context on why I'm so um, keen on, on um, knowing more and presenting more on the Greek slave. So what is the Greek slave in relation to the Smithsonian American Art Museum? Um, I should have probably prefaced everything by saying we have the largest collection of American sculpture in the world, about 2,000 objects. They're not all things that I can put on a pedestal and show. We have a lot of plasters, a lot of behind the scenes things that you can only see uh, at an arm's length distance. But um, it is one of the most satisfying places to think about American sculpture because we have such a large collection. And then within that, there are certain artists who are uh, largely represented. In 1968, the museum acquired over 150 examples of Hiram Powers studio works. And so you know, the, the, the collection runs really deep with certain artists. And this is a question I have for all of you, too. When you're selecting uh, candidates for Wikipedia or candidates who are going to get more attention in your editing, do you go for the artists who are well represented in a museum collection and you, know, you can say more, you can reference more, you can do more? Or do you go for the person who nobody's ever heard about, or who only has one piece, but you know, and but for that one piece, we'd never know about them. So that's a that's sort of a general question that we might get into um, later. So okay, back to the Hiram Powers Greek slave. I don't have a full-scale marble example of the Greek slave. However, I have what I call the the progenitor or the mama of all the other Greek slave marbles. So. Powers, working in his studio in Florence in 1843, conceives of the Greek slave. He's not yet famous. He's kind of hedging his bets. He's, he's gambling that he's going to create a subject that will capture audiences. And he doesn't yet have a client for it. So this is all on spec. So he, he models in clay this full-scale figure, life-size, of the Greek slave. This is in March 1843. He finishes it. And the formatory, the, the folks who make the plaster casts, they come in and they create a mold around the clay, and then they break open the mold and they fill it with plaster. Both the plaster and the cast that they make from the mold are made of plaster. The plaster gets loaded up with little pins, and what you see on the left is an object in our collection. This is called a pointed plaster. Pointing is a method of replication, and so the reason I call this the progenitor is this is the, the intermediary between the clay that he made and that will fall apart in time, and this means to an end, which becomes the basis of the replication. So now he takes this plaster, it's loaded with these little pins, I don't know if you can see those around her, her, her uh, rib cage, and they're also all over. And this object is upstairs in the lumber center, up on the third floor. So, uh, it's covered with these point marks, and now professional carvers in his studio use what's called a pointing device. I don't know if I have an image of Yes, here it is. Here's a, a contemporary pointing device where we're trying to figure out how it might have been used, um, sort of using something contemporary and going back. But uh, John Sonia, a sculptor from the Corcoran, uh, explaining to me how the pointing machine would have been used to register point marks on the surface of the Greek slave plaster and then he would take this device, hang it on a corresponding uh, block of marble, and then use those points and the depth to which they go into the marble to guide the carving so that you don't over-carve into the block. The Greek slave ultimately is carved from a single block of marble. Are there any questions so far? Because I know I'm covering like lots of ground. <laughs> Okay, so this plaster is really unique. We don't have the marble, but we have this plaster, and it's, um, it's closer to the hand of the artist in a way. 
um, because it's closer to that uh, ephemeral clay. And um, this is uh, another image of it, showing it with a sketchbook that's in the Archives of American Art. And this is where artists start to go crazy, because we have an archival record in Archives of American Art of what Powers was recording as he's making this. And he writes in the sketchbook, I mean, he got in his little notebook, on March 17th, slave, formatory, begin making the form. So this is the moment where he is stepping back and the plaster casters come in. And that red box that I have outlined is the inscription that's on that plaster upstairs. And that says March 12th, 1843. So we've got this amazing um, corroboration between the paper record in the archive and then the object itself. Most people don't approach the Greek slave this way. Most people approach it from either images or one of these examples. So when I go into the Wikipedia entry for the Greek slave, I'm just going to read you the first couple of sentences. The Greek slave is a marble statue in Raby Castle, carved in Florence by American sculptor Hiram Powers in 1844. Well, did Powers carve the sculpture? No. He, he, had, he had people in his studio carving it for him. Uh, and it wasn't carved in 1844, or was it? Well, 1843 is when he conceives of it, he finishes modeling the clay, and we know from our plaster that that's the date that he finishes modeling it, finishes thinking about it, but then it gets translated into the plaster and then subsequently into the marble. So I'm showing you examples, the extent mar marble examples. One was uh, lost completely, but you have the dates for each of them and the collections where they are. The Corcoran's is actually at the National Gallery now. So already I'm sort of troubled by the card in Florence by an American sculptor, because that's clearly not. How can I say the Greek slave is a marble statue in Raby Castle? Well, that's true, it is. But that's only one of the replicas. So already with sculpture, the idea of what's the original and how do you define original versus replica, and does it really matter? I mean, in some ways, an argument can be made that that clay was the original, and then the plaster is the original, and then everything else is a replica. Now, of course, the plaster is an unfinished work. If you look at the uh, the degree of the modeling on the, um, the drapery that's next to her is very unfinished. And that's only realized in the marble version. So, you know, it doesn't really exist until it gets into marble. These are really hard questions, but I mean, I can find myself going through every entry in Wikipedia and dawdling over every verb and every noun and every adjective and saying, well, that's not quite right. And, and that's what we do as art historians. We spend, you know, an unbelievable amount of time um, debating whether that's really the right term. So I guess this is one of the one of the, uh, the, the the roadblocks that I'm trying to work through or trying to figure out how to make things better um, while still grappling with the issue. Okay, copies of the statue were displayed in a number of venues around Great Britain and the United States, and it quickly became one of Power's most famous and popular works. Uh, yes. But wouldn't it be better to know what are those replicas? You know, where are they? Or which were the life-size ones? And then another thing that happens, we do have an example in marble in the collection, but it's a three-quarter life-size. So if you start counting how many replicas there are that are beyond this um, full-scale version, you end up with, I don't know, probably an uncountable number of Greek slaves. So, um, that's another sort of area of, of representation where accuracy really makes a difference. Um, yeah, and then further on into the article, it'll say Powers made six replicas of the Raby Castle Greek slave for sale to various collectors. One such variant is currently in the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Another is in the Corcoran Gallery of Art. Well, not quite, because the Corcoran actually had the marble full scale from the original, original. And ours is either the plaster full scale, pointed plaster, or it's that three quarter reduced marble. So I'm just sharing my misery. <laughs> I don't have any solutions to these. I don't know how to make it better. Um, I mean, if you spend long enough thinking about how to get it right, you end up with a totally blank page. So um, 
this, these are subjects for discussion. You know, what, what, what is going to get us there faster, and what, where is it that we really want to be with um, sculpture? Um, okay. Oh, here was another, uh, just sort of giving you the back end of the story, the studio memorandum, where in 1844, so he's finished modeling uh, the play, it's now in plaster, and in 44, so after that plaster was cast, he's still working out what the chains should look like, and you can just see from the edge of that pencil how diminutive that little sketch is in the archive book. Um, so, you know, in some ways, this, this is the story that I want people to know. I want to know about how the Greek slave is made. I don't, I don't think people will benefit quite as much from knowing, oh, there's one version in Raby Castle. They, don't they also want to know, you know, the archival backstory um, to all of this? And uh, things that are on the horizon for us, one reason why this is so important to me is we had our plaster x-ray. And I just love this image, um, showing the x-ray of the Greek slave, showing the armature, telling us more about how it was made. And it also encouraged us to put it on display. So it's going on view July 4th weekend. It should be up for about a year, perhaps longer. And one of the things that we've done to understand the object more is we partnered with the 3D scan division, um, which you know, does things like scan mammal bones and, and other wonderful relics in the collection. They also do some artwork, and this was the first example from our collection to be scanned with this 3D technology. So what that means is that more people will be able to access the Greek slave because that 3D scan will be um, accessible through the website once they finish the rendering. And so if you have a 3D printer in your classroom, for example, you can print the Greek slave eventually, the same way that you can print uh, Lincoln's uh, life mask from the portrait gallery. So you know, what, what does that mean? Well, that means people will be able to use the Greek slave to talk about images of slavery, um, sort of whitewashed images of slavery, uh, technology in the 19th century, the, how the pointing machine worked, any number of things. Also, um, uh, one more thing about the scanning that I want to, oh, but the scanning itself is a way of preserving the plaster, because however fragile that clay was, that it needed to be translated into plaster, the plaster itself is also very fragile. And so scanning it is a, a conservation, a preservation of the object. Um, and there's they're just a page of some of the other projects that I can't wait to see the slave next to, you know, the mastodon bones and things like that. So before I switch gears, um, let me see. A couple of other talks. If you look, and I won't get too far into this because I want us to have time to talk and to also explore. <coughs> um, but if you look at the Hiram Powers entry versus the Great Slave entry um, in Wikipedia, you know I feel like neither of them quite get the quite get what I really love to see. Um, but even between the two of them, they're variations. I think in some ways the Greek slave. Um, gets closer to what an art historian would hope to see. But then you start to wonder, you know, is what an art historian would hope to see really going to serve the greatest number of viewers? Um, sometimes we use really esoteric language. Sometimes we have to, because we're talking about really precise things that um, you know, are not common knowledge. Um, but I think one area for improvement could be sources. I was intrigued to see that um, I forget which of the two now, cites um, a collection of archival letters in Vermont, which is great because that's where Powers was born, and I didn't know about that collection of letters. But wouldn't it be nice if it also cited the Archives of American Art so that you could go in and see these hundreds of documents or see the sketchbook itself? Um, so that's, that's sort of, you know, as a test case, one of the things that I feel would be a really satisfying visit to, to the entry. Um, any questions so far? Again, I'm covering like all the 19th century sculptures we look at. So I'm going to move into direct carving. Oh, this was just to remind us what the entry. Um, okay, so direct carving. So by now you understand um, this kind of big fraud that a lot of sculpture that you look at is not touched by the hand of the artist. I mean, Michelangelo sort of fulfills the myth, but that's really the exception to the rule. There are many, many accomplished sculptors who never get involved with the end game of what they're producing. Some do, 
and some don't, and some use various degrees of control. So I'm just showing you blocks from the quarry in Carrara. Um, it's a contemporary shop with a diamond cutter, which they would never use in the 19th century. But just to give you a sense of what's involved between you know, going from that mountain to making a sculpture. And the sculpture I picked is Nydia by Randolph Rogers. Anyone want to guess how many replicas of Nydia there are in the world? Just like throw it out. So there's six full-scale versions of the Greek slave, but how many do you think there are of Nydia? More. More. <laughs> it's, it's hard to document. And the 19th century didn't regard originality through you know, the, the uniqueness of this one very special, unobtainable version. They didn't really care if there were replicas, which is amazing when you think of how much work went into making these replicas. You know, now we have 3D printing, and we sort of do care about well, how many of these are out there. <laughs> So there are, we think, around 168 versions of Nydia. And actually, if you go to American museums around the country, you will tend to find Nydia on view somewhere in the collection. So um, I'm just showing you this to sort of you know, fill in a little bit of the backstory of, of replication. So what happens in the early 19th, I'm sorry, early 20th century, there's this rebellion. It starts in Europe, but it also uh, comes to the United States. It starts in Europe around 1905. People like um, Constantine Brancusi and Modigliani, who's getting it from Brancusi, looking, neither of them are shown on the screen, um, looking at uh, another way of working. They don't want to outsource everything to carvers. They don't want to send everything to a foundry where many, many foundry hands are going to make something. They want a more direct experience, and so direct carving emerges. Now, of course, direct carving never really went away. If you think about the Venus of Willendorf and other like prehistoric examples, right? Those are all direct carved. So this gets us into territory about what's fine art, what's uh, folk art, what's um, kind of art of the people that's always existed. And what we recently put on view in the corridor, I don't know how many of you came in through the G Street entrance, but there's a, a corridor display that's brand new and it's showing examples of direct carving from the permanent collection here. So I'm showing you just the, the, the two sides of, of sculpting that we've talked about so far. On the left you see William Zorak modeling traditionally, and what he's modeling is in clay, and it's gonna have to go through many, many iterations before it ends up in either bronze or marble. And on the right is Heim Gross, who's just going straight at it with his tools and the wood. And I always love the, the idea of that nude figure, right? I mean, she could be anybody, but there's sort of this um, immediacy, right? The, the, even the physical immediacy of him doing all this work right in front of her. And she's there in a way to almost authenticate him. I don't know that she actually does, but does that look like me? Did he get it right? Whereas in the other one, there's this huge divide between the object and the, fin the, the finished object and the artist. Um, so, oh, this is just another image of a typical artist studio. Um, anyone want to guess who the artist is in this? The only one of them is, the, the, is Adolf Weinman. The one on the ladder, yeah. But he kind of looks like everybody. He doesn't look like he has more authority than anyone else, but I just, again, show it to give you a sense of what typically goes on in the studio. Um, and this is a foundry scene with you know, countless hands. So uh, again, Hein Gross, um, he's just kind of my poster boy for direct carving. And there are really excellent records on him. There's a Hein Gross Foundation in New York. We have a few pieces in the collection. Um, the portrait by Milton Avery in the National Portrait Gallery. I didn't check his record in Wikipedia, but you know, sometimes it's about the availability about uh, what material is already out there. This is just a sampling of direct carving from the collection. Um, when it emerges in the United States, it's influenced by the immigration of artists from Eastern Europe, where there is this deep uh, direct carving tradition in folk art. And it's also influenced by the availability of materials. I and mean, you can see a lot of color in wood and stone. Um, and they're looking at the same sources as American uh, modernists so, and, and European artists, like the same way that um, Picasso and others of this early modernist movement are looking at African art. The, the direct harbors are, are too looking at African art. So these are, this is just a view to remind you all to go and have a look.
Um, and here I'm going to get into, you know, when is it better to showcase the artist who we have so much on and so little comparable on Wikipedia versus the artist who kind of has been languishing in storage for a while and is now finally on view and wouldn't it be great to have a Wikipedia entry. Um, so there, there are a number of artists in here who, again, I didn't go one by one to see who's in there, but Sarah, I think you started to do that. I did start to do that. And in fact, the page for today's event, um, the to-do list, you can see uh, many of the artists are linked here, and it's also links to the exhibition page, which highlights 29 of the works that are on view. And there are, it's, the gallery's over um, where the gift shop is, on the other side, there's a little corridor right there, and you can see really beautiful works. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, again, some of the artists that are represented, they also had other works in the collection that I couldn't get out from stories for practical reasons. Uh, there was a seven foot tall redwood tree that became the basis of the sculpture and very impractical to get it conserved and moved. But, um, you know, that work was made in the 1940s by an immigrant artist working in New York, Enrico Lichtenstein, and he called it national defense. And it was his statement on um, Nazi Europe and the American entrance into the war, the U.S. entrance into the war. This was a hugely political piece with you know, incredible personal meaning to the artist, and I really wish I had been able to take it and put it on view, but I couldn't. Um, another work, too, by Aaron Goldman, who's not terribly well known, but he did a piece about lynching, and the piece was called Culture, K-U-L-T-U-R. And, um, you know, it shows the body of a person who is shackled. And it's interesting because not only is it referencing the lynching through the tree itself that's now become a branch, that's now become a sculpture, but the body of the person who's actually resisting um, is, is shown in the wood. So it's a sort of conflation of things. But anyway, you know, in, in some ways, the, the digital presence, the, the virtual experience of the museum gives people an opportunity to see things that I can't get out on view right now. Um, they just didn't fit in the checklist, but this is an opportunity to sort of expand accessibility. So, okay. Um, I, I could give you names of people who were represented in the way Powers is with very deep um, records, but I think it would be better if we first started talking about some of the things I said and um, maybe talked about you know, issues that, that you find challenging or, or criteria that you find important. 